God sent hope to Israel as he sent the people of Israel someone who could protect and guide them on his behalf. That someone is the archangel Michael, the protector of Israel both in the Bible and in the present. Every time Israel faces difficulties, God still shows that he is with his people in one way or another. These signs help Israel become stronger during the conflict. What happened in Israel? Was Archangel Michael sighted in Israel? Join us in exploring the appearance of Archangel Michael in Israel. Despite about 2,500 years of scattering and prosecution, the people of Israel have survived, and God sent an angel to protect them. Furious attempts to annihilate these people, from the Babylonians to Queen Isabella to Hitler, have all failed woefully. The survival of the Jews, despite the disappearance of many other countries, indicates their protection over the ages. Moreover, in recent years, the Almighty has restored the historic nation and blessed her. In merely 100 years, the Jewish population of Israel has risen an amazing 7.7% through mass Jewish immigration. Israel is the epicenter of the difficulties of our times, but it should be noted that God has never abandoned His promised land. As a chosen people, Israel has been blessed by God, so He gives an angel to protect His people. Michael is an archangel, a pure spirit created by God and sent as a messenger of importance to humanity. Eyewitnesses report seeing a celestial vision above the Israeli armored vehicles. This sight, which resembled a swarm of angels, energized Israeli troops while instilling fear and awe in their Arab opponents. It appeared to be a divine shield. Many analysts and believers see this unprecedented event as a sign of divine intervention protecting Israel at a crucial point. It articulates the perseverance of the Israeli people as well as the complexities of geopolitical relations in the Middle East during this tough period. Historically, when the Jewish state was born in May 1948, five Arab armies, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq, immediately invaded Israel. Arab rulers presumed they were heading towards an easy victory. They had no difficulty obtaining all the arms they needed. Israel was viewed as a virtually defenseless link, but they were wrong, as the Arab armies suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of a combination of Jewish militias. Certainly, Israel's strength and perseverance must be acknowledged, but this must have involved God's intervention in the Six-Day War in 1967. The armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and later Iraq attacked Israel again, their goal was to wipe Israel off the map. The Arab armies had huge superiority in armor, aircraft, and troops. As a result of this, Israel resolved to make a preemptive strike aimed at destroying the Arab air forces on the ground link. After the war, Israel held the Sinai, the Golan Heights, Gaza, the West Bank, and for the first time in 2,500 years, all of Jerusalem. As in the 1948 war, this rapid military defeat of the Arab armies is attributed in part to the lack of coordination among Arab states. Bible scholars see the defeat as God preparing the way for Christ's millennial rule from Jerusalem. In October 1973, hoping to win back the territory lost to Israel in 1967, Egyptian and Syrian forces launched a coordinated attack against Israel on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. For Jews, Yom Kippur, also called the Day of Atonement, is a solemn time of rest, prayer, and fasting, a time of sincere reflection on the state of one's relationship or at one with God. So this attack came at a time when Israel was resting and looking to God with the element of surprise. To their advantage, Egyptian forces successfully crossed the Suez Canal, suffering only a fraction of the anticipated casualties, while Syrian forces were able to launch their offensive against Israeli positions and break through to the Golan Heights. Despite the ambush and consequent heavy losses, Israel once again defeated the attack, with urgent U.S. help. It seems the Almighty helped Israel once more when they were unprepared this time. In early December 2016, a strange storm cloud of dust and rain put a barrier between Israel and ISIS. 
Reports say the storm stopped on the border of Syria and was unable to enter Israel's Golan Heights area. Many believe God intervened on behalf of Israel to prevent ISIS from entering Israel. The imminent Gog and Magog war against Israel will demonstrate to the world that God still protects his people. Israelis. When Russian-led Islamic armies came against Israel from the north, God promised to help Israel. However, protection is sometimes conditional. When the nation of Israel walked away from their God and protector, these promises seemed not to apply, and Israel was scattered throughout the nations for some 2,500 years. The scenario is similar today. Most of the 8 million inhabitants of Israel do not recognize Jesus as their promised Messiah. Hence, according to prophecy, it seems Israel will go through a time of great trouble soon. It will be a time of the refining of Israel until they recognize their true Messiah. Michael's first appearance in sacred scripture or the first mention of the holy archangel does not appear until the book of Daniel. The prophet has a vision of an angelic being who is identified as the archangel Gabriel. Daniel chapter 10 verse 5 says, I lifted up my eyes, and I saw, and behold, a man clothed in linen, and his loins were girded with the finest gold. Then Gabriel reveals to Daniel the spiritual resistance he experienced while trying to convince the Persian king, Cyrus, to let the Jewish people return to Israel. Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 says, But the prince of the kingdom of the Persians resisted me one and twenty days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there by the king of the Persians. In some translations, the word prince is replaced by the word angel, indicating the spiritual battle that was going on. Because Gabriel was unable to complete the task on his own, the help of Michael was enlisted. Later in Daniel, the holy archangel returns, this time in a prophetic vision of the end of the world that is mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. This is the first time Michael is seen as one who protects the people of Israel, saving them from their enemies. His name is never mentioned again in the Old Testament, and his presence is not seen directly until the letter of St. Jude. There he is referenced in connection to an event that occurred immediately after Moses' death. The dispute was a Jewish tradition that was passed down through the centuries, where Michael is seen as a protector of the body of Moses. Michael's most memorable appearance in the Bible is in the book of Revelation, where he is seen as the head of a heavenly army, casting a great dragon down to earth. This is described in detail in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. This is likely the most powerful view of Michael, showing him as a forceful warrior able to strike Satan down, casting the evil serpent out of heaven infinitely. Based on these scripture passages, it appears that Michael was sent to earth as a protector and warrior. He has the power to defeat Satan and can help protect us from our spiritual enemies. Yet that is not the end of the story. St. Michael will continue his mission of being present and protecting his people in general and the people of Israel in particular. The protector of the people of God was the cry of the great archangel when he smote the rebel Lucifer in the conflict of the heavenly hosts. From that hour, he has been known as Michael, captain of the armies of God, the archetype of divine fortitude, and the champion of every faithful soul in strife with the powers of evil. Furthermore, we see him in Holy Scripture as the special guardian of the children of Israel, their comfort and protector in times of sorrow or conflict. He is the one who prepares their return from the Persian captivity when the prophet Daniel prays for that favor, who leads the valiant males to victory in battle after the prayer of Judas Maccabeus ever since its foundation by Jesus Christ. The church has venerated St. Michael as her special patron and protector. She invokes him by name in her confitior. When accusing her faults, she summons him to the side of her children in the agony of death and chooses him as their escort from the chastening flames of purgatory to the realms of holy light. Lastly, when Antichrist has set up his kingdom on earth, it is Michael who will unfurl once more the standard of the cross. 
This is known from a prophecy of Scripture, which states clearly that in those days, the great Prince Michael will rise to protect the children of God. During the plague in Rome in the 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great saw St. Michael in a vision, sheathing his flaming sword to show that he would put an end to the scourge that was ravaging the city. In 608, a church was erected in thanksgiving to St. Michael for the help he gave. Many believe they are being watched over by God's angels, that angels are still among us. Their name, angel, means messenger, and we can be assured that when they are here, they have come for a very specific purpose. Throughout history, angels have been sent by God to bring a message of hope, to protect, comfort, serve, carry out His judgment, and give Him praise. There are some people in today's world who have had encounters with angels. Perhaps some are aware of these angelic meetings. Perhaps others are clueless that they have walked or possibly talked with an angel. Psalm chapter 91 verses 11 to 12 says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Indeed, God offers His pure and selfless existence through the use of His angels. God commands many angels to guard us. God commands those faithful spirits who are nearest to Him, who come from Him and are marked by Him, to guard us in all our ways. God's promise through the psalmist to Jesus applies to us as well. Exodus chapter 23 verse 20 says, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. This is where the Lord promises the Israelites that they will be guided and kept on their way through the wilderness to the promised land of Canaan. It was no ordinary angel either. It was the angel of the Lord, an Old Testament manifestation of Christ. Angels are sent by God to protect us and help us inherit His full kingdom. The Bible tells us that angels are His servants, carrying out His will and working for our good. This is known from a verse from Hebrews that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who are going to receive salvation. By definition, salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences brought about by faith in Jesus Christ. Having celebrated God's mercy to his people, the psalmist praises God's excellent majesty and universal dominion. The psalmist acknowledges God's angels who do his bidding intervene, protect on his behalf, and are obedient to his word. We are called in this verse to be hospitable or friendly to those we don't know. The Bible tells us that some have entertained or hosted messengers of God unaware. When we meet strangers, we should be careful how we treat them because it could be someone who was sent by God to help us or protect us. We don't know what God is trying to do or what He is trying to accomplish, but we know that it is a part of His good and perfect will. We also know that there are millions of angels encircling God's throne and glorifying the Lord. We see a different side of angels here discovering that in addition to being protectors, they are also powerful glorifiers of the Lord. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we can be confident that He still works in the same powerful ways, for He never changes. Satan, the enemy, intends evil, but God promises good according to Scripture. Satan was the highest of all angels in heaven, but because of his great pride, Desiring to be worshipped and set up above God, he was thrown out and he took one-third of the angels with him. These are the demonic dark spiritual forces we are up against today, and you can be assured that the enemy knows how to disguise himself. As an angel, Satan's whole intent is to lead us into traps of destruction and to draw our worship away from God. Live aware and don't be easily deceived. God promises to help us as we seek to honor Him and walk wisely in this life. We can trust that when we are unaware of our needs or impending disasters that lay before us, God knows the way He is at work, sending words of hope, protecting His children, attending to our needs, bringing justice and mercy to our land, drawing us closer to Himself, encouraging us to walk wisely, be aware, and live fully for Him. He often works in ways we can't fully see, sometimes behind the scenes or with unexpected timing. Regardless, 
He is always working on our behalf. Whether we realize it or not, there is a spiritual realm constantly around us. May God give us eyes to see clearly that angels are among us and that God is working miracles to date. Some people believe that the angel from this passage represents God himself appearing in angelic form. The angel speaks as God, such as when the angel declares in Exodus chapter 33 verse 19 that I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The identity of the presence that went with the children of Israel is both the Lord and the angel of God. This angel was a cut above ordinary angels, for God's very name was in him. Also, he could forgive sins, and who can forgive sins but God alone? The angel of the Lord was personally guiding the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land. The fact that the angel appeared in a glorious cloud is also a clue that he is the angel of the Lord, who many Christians believe is Jesus Christ appearing, before his incarnation. Later in history in the Old Testament, God manifested His presence by a visible glowing cloud signifying His glory. Israel was led by a pillar of fire and a cloud in the New Testament. Jesus Christ was often accompanied by the same type of cloud. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, He is coming with clouds and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him. Jesus was clothed in a cloud like this the last time the Apostle John saw him ascend into heaven, and John heard the angels who spoke with the Apostles say that Jesus would return similarly, Jeremiah writes in what the Bible says about angels. It seems highly possible that in the Old Testament, Christ came to earth in the form of an angel, the greatest angel, an angelic reminder of God's faithfulness. No matter who the angel is, Michael, or anyone else, he still serves as a powerful reminder of God's faithfulness to believers. The angel here continues his redemptive role from the beginning of God's redemptive work in Israel. Regardless of the mystery surrounding his precise identity, and although he is not frequently mentioned in Exodus, he is no doubt a central figure in Israel's redemption. Furthermore, when we keep in mind the virtual equation of the angel and Yahweh, it follows that the angel's presence is an indication of God's presence with his people. From beginning to end, his appearance here reminds Israel of God's faithfulness. In the book of Daniel, we witness Michael's role as he comes to the aid of Israel during the Persian captivity. When the prophet Daniel prays for help, it is Mikael who assists and ensures their return from captivity. Moreover, a prophecy foretells that during challenging times, the great prince, Mikael, will rise to protect the children of God. These biblical accounts showcase Archangel Michael as a powerful guardian and protector of Israel, offering divine assistance and safeguarding the nation in times of need, reinforcing the deep connection between the Archangel and the chosen people. Archangel Michael is wonderful. For context, imagine a best friend who could stand beside you and love you enough to protect you from the dark energies of others. Humans can be bullies sometimes, maybe at work, at home, or in holy places. Whenever Archangel Michael is called upon to give strength or to merely talk with him about how to handle a situation, he always comes through. He is not only a powerful angel, well-versed in how to slay the darkness, but he is also the best friend next to God that anybody could ever have. Whenever you need guidance or assurance of strength in facing one of life's dilemmas, call upon him. He will hear and answer your call. Another time that the Bible mentions the Archangel Michael is in Jude chapter 1 verse 9. There, Jude describes Michael arguing with Satan after Moses died, contending over Moses' body and rebuking Satan's attempt to claim it. Deuteronomy 34 doesn't mention demons or angels fighting over Moses' body after he died. It just says that Moses was buried, possibly by God, at an undisclosed location in a Moabite valley opposite Beth Peor, says Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 to 6. 
Scholars have gone back and forth about where Jude got this information about Michael and Satan fighting over Moses' body, with many claiming that he is citing a scene from one of the obscure Jewish apocryphal books, probably the Apocalypse of Moses or the Testament of Moses. The third and final time that the Bible mentions the archangel Michael is in Revelation 12. There, John has a vision of a war in heaven where Michael leads an army of angels against a dragon, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, says Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Ultimately, the dragon loses the battle and is cast out of heaven, but on earth, he leads people astray. Like the book of Daniel, Revelation is apocalyptic, and the exact timeline of events is hard to determine. However, it's often understood that John is seeing a vision of a battle that took place before the creation of the world, a battle where Satan rebelled against God and fell like lightning from heaven, as Luke chapter 10 verse 18 puts it. Isaiah 14:12-14 14, 14 is often cited as talking about the same event, with Satan being the person referred to as the morning star or light bringer, where we get the name Lucifer from. Michael, in the Bible, is one of the archangels. He is repeatedly depicted as the great captain, the leader of the heavenly hosts, and the warrior helping the children of Israel. Early in the history of the Christian church, he came to be regarded as the helper of the church's armies against the heathen and the attacks of the devil. He holds the secret of the mighty word by the utterance of which God created heaven and earth, and was the angel who spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, says Acts chapter 7, verse 38. The numerous representations of Michael in art reflect his character as a warrior. He is shown with a sword in combat with, or triumph over a dragon, from the story in the book of Revelation, Apocalypse. In the Roman Catholic Church, the feast of the appearing or apparition of St. Michael, the archangel, is kept on May 8th. According to legend, this appearance took place on Mount Gargano in Apulia about 492, and the mountain became an important medieval pilgrimage site. A formal prayer to St. Michael originated with Pope Leo Thirst in 1886. Traditionally, the Jews have divided their scriptures into three parts. The Torah, meaning the law, or Pentateuch. The Nevi'im, meaning prophets. And the Ketuvim, meaning writings or hagiographa. The Pentateuch, together with the book of Joshua, hence the name Hexateuch, can be seen as the account of how the Israelites became a nation and of how they possessed the promised land. The division designated as the prophets continues the story of Israel in the promised land, describing the establishment and development of the monarchy and presenting the messages of the prophets to the people. The writings include speculation on the place of evil and death in the scheme of things, as seen in Job and Ecclesiastes, the poetical works, and some additional historical books. In the Apocrypha of the Old Testament, various types of literature are represented. The purpose of the Apocrypha seems to have been to fill in some of the gaps left by the indisputably canonical books and to carry the history of Israel to the second century BCE. The Bible is the sacred scriptures of Judaism and Christianity. The Christian Bible consists of the Old Testament and the New Testament, with the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox versions of the Old Testament being slightly larger because they accept certain books and parts of books considered apocryphal by Protestants. The Hebrew Bible includes only books known to Christians as the Old Testament. The arrangements of the Jewish and Christian canons differ considerably. The Protestant and Roman Catholic arrangements more nearly match one another. The New Testament is by far the shorter portion of the Christian Bible, but through its associations with the spread of Christianity, it has wielded an influence far out of proportion to its modest size. Like the Old Testament, the New Testament is a collection of books, including a variety of early Christian literature. The four Gospels deal with the life, the person, and the teachings of Jesus, as he was remembered by the Christian community. 
the Acts of the Apostles carry the story of Christianity from the resurrection of Jesus to the end of the career of St. Paul. The various letters or epistles are correspondence by various leaders of the early Christian church, chief among them St. Paul, applying the message of the church to the sundry needs and problems of early Christian congregations. The Book of Revelation, or the Apocalypse, is the only canonical representative of a large genre of apocalyptic literature that appeared in the early Christian movement. Thank you for watching. Kindly like and subscribe for more videos like this.